Open your Bibles to 1 Samuel 28. <clears throat> this might be my last study. I may have one, one more. I don't know. I'm undecided. But I'm close to the end because my guys died. died. So Samuel's died. This is the life of Samuel, so... <laughs> Twenty-eight. I'm in First Samuel twenty-eight tonight, and I'm going to refer to the the woman that was a medium that called up Samuel. <clears throat> I'm going to give her the name that is her famous name in literature. She's called the witch, which is fine. That's that's a King James concept, which witches and wizards, you know, female and male. But anyhow, it just, I kind of like the witch of Endor. I mean, it just sounds good, doesn't it? Well, I don't know if it sounds good, but better than medium. Uh, I'm in 28. I'm going to look at 19 through 21 verses, the verse 19 through 21. I want to focus on a specific idea. Um... This is in uh, <clears throat> Samuel, Samuel said, he's been called up and he's responded in verse 16. Well, actually 15. And I'm picking up in the middle of this conversation. Moreover, the Lord will also talking to him about, <clears throat> you called me and want to, want to get some information, okay? I'm going to give it to you. <laughs> I'm going to give you the information. Moreover, the Lord will also give over Israel. He's talking about what's going to happen what's going to happen tomorrow. Moreover, the Lord will also give over Israel along with you into the hands of the Philistines. Therefore, tomorrow, you and your sons will be with me. Indeed, the Lord will give over the army of Israel into the hands of the Philistines. And of course, then Saul falls full length upon the ground and is afraid of the words of Samuel. Listen, he always had a problem with it, didn't he? And he's going to die with it. Uh, there was no strength left in him, and then the woman came to him um, and said, Behold, your, in verse 21, Behold, your maidservant has obeyed you. I have taken my life into my hand and have listened to your words which you spoke to me. And... Uh, <laughs> I don't know if she thought he was having a heart attack or what was going on, but she didn't need to have the king. We went, I showed you on the map where they were. They were eight miles behind the enemy line, and they were at war. And um, he had just purged the nation while she was operating. He had purged the nation of divination. I mean, he ran them out of the country or killed them, one of the two. And she survived that. And now she's, this guy has had what you call a heart attack in her midst. I mean, he got this word from Samuel and he just, she realized that. But she apparently was afraid he, she, he was going to die. The king of Israel was going to die on her watch. And, and she was going to be a cook goose. Um, she worried about that. And rightly so. And rightly so. Uh, so I want to talk about that today. I want to, my theme out of this thing is, and I want to close down a little more on her, but on, on divination and a nation, but also this concept of tomorrow. Tomorrow. He says to her, tomorrow. Or he says to Saul, tomorrow. I need tomorrow. And you know where, you know where, you know where Samuel was? He was in Sheol. He was in the heart of the earth. He was in. He was where Old Testament <laughs> believers went when they died. And it's just interesting to me. He's not in a place where I wouldn't think tomorrow is relevant. And apparently to his life it wasn't. But to Saul's it was. 
and he came up with a word of God that was relevant to the living. He came from a that's important to the living with the word tomorrow, meaning tomorrow, not some generic idea, is it? I mean, he means tomorrow. And, and, and if you read on in here, by the, 30, by the time you get to the 31st, 31st chapter in this great war that went on, uh, he's going to die and his two sons. Uh, that is Saul. So let's have a word of prayer and then we'll get into this study tonight I, I, that I entitled The Witch of Endor because I'm after the concept of divination. But the theme is um, God is in control. Listen, not, not, uh, listen, here's the, listen to me. Look up here a minute. Here, here's, the, here's the theme I hope we get away with. Listen, God's in charge of your yesterdays, your todays, and your tomorrows. And what I found interesting that here's a guy who has died and he is in Sheol. Today we would say, I mean, he's in Abraham's bosom according to Luke 16. In Luke 16, he's in Abraham's bosom as an Old, Old Testament believer. And He's in the reality of God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He is the same. I mean, the rea he's living that reality. I mean, we believe it by faith. But he believes that in the reality of life. Do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, it's a wonderful thing to have the faith that says that God's in charge of my life yesterday, today, and forever. And that's a great concept because it's actually true. Here's a man speaking from the dead that says that tr that is an absolute truth. Uh, well, anyhow, let's have a word of prayer. I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest, and that this applies, classroom etiquette applies to these and my Bible study as well as those who are with me by the Internet. Classroom etiquette, you, it's a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual information, the Word of God to the will of God, to the work of God. You can't study this book in carnality. You can't learn it. You can't live it in carnality. It's a dead book for you. It comes alive, according to Hebrews 4.12, when you activate it by faith. And a spiritual person is a person that does that. The ministry of the Holy Spirit is to teach you and then bring it to application of your life and the dynamics of, of how it's written. It's an inspired word of God. And it will be inspired in its learning. It will be inspired in its application in your soul. So how do I get from carnality? How do I identi identify carnality, personal sin? How then do I get from there back to spirituality? 1 John 1, 9, if I confess my sin, he's faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me. That takes me into out of carnality and back to spirituality under the principle of sanctification, experiential sanctification. So if I confess my sins, mental attitude sins, sins the tongue of hurt sins, I, that's my priesthood responsibility of 1 Peter 2. I confess them. I'm in a spiritual position to be able to hear, understand, believe, and ready for application to my my life, the word of God. So, Father, how thankful we are today for these that have come our way, both by automobile and the Internet. We pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the word of God into our souls through the functional ministry of the Holy Spirit, both in the learning and the living of it. It is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual service, and, and we understand that principle. We bring that principle to this hour of study. Uh, on the witch of Endor. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this is either my final lesson or we'll have one more coming up. I'm not quite sure yet. But today's lesson involves King Saul enlisting the witch of Endor to consult with Samuel, who is dead and is in Sheol. Unger's Bible Dictionary uh, identifies the, witch, the term witch of Endor that it became a popular liter literature, even mu movie, but the Bible doesn't use that word witch. It uses the word medium, sorcerer, 
something like that. But it is part of divination. But so the witch of Endor, if you have an English translation, this he's going to describe this person as a medium. Uh, it, but it's a person who is a professional practitioner of divination. This is not, I mean, this is a professional. This witch of Endor, and she, and she apparently was head. I mean, she was popular and uh, escaped the purging by Saul of the of divination. You can sh see how desperate he was. Um, I mean, he should have purged it because the word of God says purge it. He shouldn't have. But, you know, he, when God said, I'm through, I am through supporting you. I'm you're a king until I, I put you to death. You're a king, but I'm not supporting it. Remember that? And with Drew said, I reject you. I reject. Now, he, he rejected his service, not his sonship. <clears throat> when he dies, he's going to go to be with Samuel. Samuel said that, didn't he? He said, tomorrow you'll be with me. I mean, just like Jesus, the thief on the cross. So, let me, let me talk about five things here. In the English Bible, uh, the witch of the indoor in, in popular literature is technically called the, the medium of divination. But I wanted you, I wanted, notice I wrote this out. I want to show you the Hebrew because this is really interesting, the way it was done in Hebrew. Nobody wrote it out in any translation the way the Hebrew stated it. So I want you to see it. Now, remember in Hebrew, you read from the right to the left. All right? So I want to show you something. See, that's a, see the B-A, then we have a silent A, right? We have an I in that thing that looks like a Y, that's an I in, that's a silent, done, take a letter. So you got B-A-A-A-H. Now, the B-A-A-L, look, watch this now. See, the A-H on the end of that word makes that female. That A-H on the A end of that word, B-A-A-A-L. A-H, see, Baal, that A-H, see? So that makes that female. This is, but look at the word that's there. B-A-A-L is what? Baal. I mean, we're all familiar with that whole system. And that's a, that's a, 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 a system, Baal is not just a god, but in, in the Philistines, it was a, a highly organized religion. It's a highly organized religion. And she is a medium of that system. This is, and then, and so she's, and and this ob at the other end, the other word it has an x that's an aleph that's silent it doesn't take a letter and so you go to the ob 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 that's necromancy she is the mistress of baal of necromancy in other words she specializes in calling up the dead She is the, she is a professional. She is the mistress of Baal, of necromancy. That's how she's described in the Hebrew. She's a professional. Um, now we know the whole Baal system runs, all of divination runs under Satan's program of divination uh, or, and it, it's run by demons. Right? The whole system is run by demons. I mean, that's, that's how religions run. They don't care how they whitewash it. I mean, it's a system that opposes God. And, and so this is what this is. And it's just interesting because we're often familiar with the, the, the Baal, the Thaley cult, and all these kind of things.
listen, it was a highly organized religion, highly organized religion in the land of Palestine. And all the seven nations, all the seven nations that occupied the land of Canaan, this was their religion. And it, and it was a horrendous, I mean, they offered human sacrifices and, and every imaginable lust that man has, they, they tried to meet that need. It was a religion of lust. It wasn't a religion of love, and it wasn't a religion of God. I mean, it, they had a God. It was a little G, and they, had a, and they had a high system. They had a high system of gods. They had a system for males and for females, like the witch and the wizards and that. So, it, I mean, a lot of times we read this stuff, and we think, oh, well, probably she's just a gal with a Ouija board, or maybe she's, you know... You see her little, you see her little house trailer on the way to Florida, it's close, especially when you get closer to Florida, and you got. She says, "Come in, and I'll read your, you know, your palm." And and we're not talking about that. We're talking about a highly organized national religion, and then we're all over the Middle East. They, it was in Egypt. They were in Egypt. They were everywhere. And, and there for a long time. So this is, uh, this is who this woman is. And uh, she's apparently uh, well known because his staff, his top advisors knew she still existed when he said, I would like to find... I listen to this conversation. I'd like to find me a, a, a witch. I'd like to find me a medium. I need to consult the dead. I need I need somebody that's really good in necromancy. But I don't know what we're going to do because I killed them all. I got rid of all of them. And he's upset about that. I mean, geez, you think I could have kept one or two around? Right? I don't know what's going through his head, but he's got a staff there and he's going, he's lamenting this idea. And one of them wanted to be promoted, says, I think I got, I think I got your answer. You know, what he should have said, you just got demoted, go out there and kill that sucker because I missed one, right? Go, go arrest him or do something with him. They can't be operating, but he didn't. He promote. you know, you, well, you just got promoted um, take me to her. But he knew. And listen, uh, she, she lived a long way. She lived a long way. She was all the way up into Iskar. She, she lived a long way from where they were, where the capital was operating from. I just find that interesting. I mean, he had a good team around him, but uh, they kept a lot of things undercover, didn't they? They, had, they were running their own little agenda which I find interesting. I, I guess we call that politics, don't we? Politics. Well, uh, she was a person, a professional in this religion who was known to be able to practice uh, calling up the dead. Call, not bringing them up, but calling them up. Making contact. Okay? Now, what is interesting, see that word ob, ob? Well, in the Greek, that's, that's where you get um, um, the, the Greek idea, I wrote in your paper, uh, egastromuthos. You've heard of that word, egastromuthos demon? The egastromuthos? Well, in the Greek, that's the word for ob in the Hebrew. And in the English, you translate this tranquility. Hmm? Somebody can throw their voice. Which just makes this all kind of interesting. Uh, and, the, and, and when they did their seances, they used, they used muttering. And this is important that you understand. I'm going to show it to you in a minute. They used muttering and whispering in their seances. And they would tell you, when they would contact the dead, they would tell you what the dead was saying, and they would whisper. They, there was a whole nother 
there was a whole nother uh, conversation of voice that wasn't normal in the person. Are you with me? Sometimes it would be very low and sometimes it would be very high. And so they called it muttering and whispering. The person would take on a different um, vocal identity, a completely different vocal identity, and that was a demon. Isaiah 29.4 talks about it. Then you will be brought low from the earth you will speak, and from the dust where you are prostrate, your words will come. Your voice will also be like that of a spirit. The, and that's the word ob. The King James calls it a familiar spirit because it means that somebody wanted it, you contacted it, and you were familiar with, with that, that spirit. You were familiar with it. The, whoever wanted the requ requested it was familiar with that. You're going to see that in this except it's done completely different, it freaks her out. It freaked her out because she actually, that, that Samson actually showed up in a form. I mean Samuel. Samuel showed up in a form. And she described him, right, wearing a robe. And he goes like, well, that's, that's Samuel. You know, he's wearing a robe. What kind? Is a house robe or, or a preacher robe? You know, <laughs> in a bathrobe? But, but what is interesting is the word spirit in this. In Isaiah 29, 4, what is interesting is they, it is not the word for spirit. It is the word for ob. It's not the typical Hebrew word. And so, uh, and the spirit from the ground. And... Uh, and your, and your speech will whisper, will whisper from the dust. So I, I just want you to get a background of what's going on. Number two, the mediums used incantations, which we call whispers and muttering in their seances. For example, in Isaiah 8, 19, he says, when they say to you, consult the medium and the spiritualist, actually, I don't think that's spiritualist. I don't think there's an a, a UAL in that. I think they're just called spirit, spiritist. I, I kept writing that out, and I don't know why I kept doing that. Uh, consult the medium and the spiritist who whisper and mutter. Should not a people consult their God? Of course they should. Should they consult the dead on behalf of the living? Mm, no. God takes care of that. And so he said, why are you doing this? I mean, this is... This is evil. Why are you doing that? But my point is, listen, he, he says how they used it in their seances. They used the whispers and the muttering. Do you understand that? That's the demonic. During his earthly ministry, Samuel told Saul, now listen to this. And you, 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 you heard me teach you this. You probably passed over it because we're at a different idea. During his earthly ministry, Samuel told Saul, re rebellion against, and this is my take, rebellion against the directive will of God. Then he says, it is as the sin of divination. In other words, you're not, get, you're not coming to me for the truth of the word of God. You're going to somewhere else and wherever that's somebody else. If you're getting a message, if you're getting a message, it's coming from divination. It's coming from Satan. Man, there's only two, it's only two avenues of information. You're either getting it from the world, which Satan runs, right? The God of this world. Or you're getting it from God. You're getting it from one of the two sources. And he says rebellion against the word of God is, a sin of div is, is as the sin of divination. You've gone somewhere else other than the word of God to get the answers to your life questions and problems. You can see people get dabbing it. They're always trying to stay ahead of, uh, uh, stay uh, 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 one step ahead of their life. Like that's something you can do. <laughs> None of us that smart to do that. You'd be smarter just to live each day as a step brings, brings you into each step. Just walk it out. That's why you call it walk by faith, walk by spirit.
walk by the Holy Spirit, walk by faith. It's a walk out. You, you walk out. <clears throat> well, anyhow. Here's the third thing. Divination was considered an abomination. Now, you can't get worse than abomination. Abomination is, is the pit. You can't, there's nothing worse than abomination in the Bible. Nothing. Divination was considered an abomination to both the priest nation of Israel and the client nations associated with the plan of God. Deuteronomy 12, on your own, this would be well worth your time to spend a little time in the book of Deuteronomy as Deuteronomy talks about this on a national scale in Deuteronomy 12, 29 through 32. All forms of divination were considered detestable. You might find the word abomination. You might find it translated detestable. And I wrote it out to you in the Hebrew so you could see because when you say tobas, it might be hard to figure what, what that is. And so those that are interested in Hebrew, I wrote the Hebrew word out for you. That is the word detestable in the English or abomination. And these things would include witchcraft, interpreting omens, sorcerers, cast spells, mediums, and spiritist, spiritist, uh, or one who calls up the dead, necromancy, like we're familiar with. In Deuteronomy 18, 9 through 12, the thought is, for, whatever, for whoever does these things is detestable to the Lord. Whoever, do, whoever practices these things is detestable, is, is detestable to the Lord. So when Samuel says to Saul while he was still living that your rebellion against the word of God is as a sin of divination, that had great bearing to his culture, to the land and the time in which they lived. And in, um, in Isaiah, in Isaiah 2.6, we're, we're told, of course we know this, but we're told that divination was a common practice in the nations of Canaan. Uh, Deuteronomy 31, 17 through 19, they sacrificed to demons who were not God. Uh, uh, first, uh, first, uh, 1 Corinthians 10 talks about that, idolatry, the system of idolatry. On the next page, going still on that point three, the priest nation of Israel was forbidden to practice it. They were forbidden to practice it. And, and listen, in the Big Ten, uh, you know, the Ten Commandments, I mean, you know, idolatry, He's a jealous God. There are no gods before me. You will have no gods before me. And, and, and um, today that would be apropos to the church. But Israel was a priest nation. They were the custodians of the word of God evangelism, weren't they? And the equivalent of that today wouldn't be America. The equivalent of that today would be the church. America is not the custodian of that. The church is. That would be equivalent. The church must never dabble with that kind of stuff. Right? The, the results aren't going to be any better than it was for Saul. <clears throat> and so they, the priest nation was forbidden to, da to dabble with it. To, 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 it would bring divine discipline to the nation if they dabbled with it. Other people in the nation, if they're going to do it, once, once that whatever the borders of the nation of the priest nation, um, every once in a while he'd say, "I want it purged," and he'd go through and he'd purge it. Then it'd come back. He'd purge it, but it'd come back. But why? Because well, this is the warfare of the say angelic conflict within a nation, or or within a church. Let me tell you what 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 Samuel would say today to us in the church is rebellion against the word of God is the sin of divination, wouldn't he? That's exactly what he would tell us. I mean, that's hard to believe, isn't it? Rebellion against you, your rejection of the application of the truth of God's word as you understand it is, it, is, is, as, is as a sin of divination. That would be hard for most people to, to swallow, wouldn't it? Yet that's what he told 
It's exactly what Samuel told Saul. And, and that is the message to the church. I mean, you don't have to have a Ouija board to be in the sin of divination, right? You don't have to go to somebody and have them read your palm or, or tea leaves. I mean, that's, a, I mean, that's an eye-opener, isn't it? I mean, you got people practicing divination that would never believe that in a million years because they wouldn't, they wouldn't permit that at all. They tell their kids, don't do anything like that. Yet they practice it in rebellion against the word of God. I just found that interesting on Samuel's part to bring that up, and I found it to be interesting to our life. There are some key passages on this. He says it's going to bring discipline to a nation or to a believer who practices this. And, and I laid out some scriptures I think are really interesting for you to take a look at uh, later. If you're interested in this subject, Exodus 22, 18, Leviticus 19, 31, and then Leviticus 26 and 7 and 27, just key verses. And then interesting enough, it's in Psalms 106, 35 through 43, which I think is really an interesting passage. That would be well worth your time, in my opinion, to read. The others are quick and they're understandable. And when you read them, you go like, yeah, I got it. But Psalms will be well worth your time. Now, here's what I found interesting. Here's what we sometimes miss when, when, the, when, the, when God puts the divine agency into Egypt. He put the whole divine agency into Egypt. Agreed? The custodian of the word of God. I mean, put the whole kit and caboodle in there. Put Joseph, then send everybody in. And they were the light and the salt to Egypt. And Egypt was a nation just like the seven, identical to the seven nations as far as their religion. Right? I mean, if you know anything about Egypt's religion, the sun god and all that, the Nile River and all that stuff, well, when you study them, you'll see they're, they're cut off the same rug. So that when they get to the promised land, they know how bad this religion is compared to the religion they have. Are you with me? So it's just interesting. You see, God sometimes puts you in a place that's preparing you for something greater and you're going through a lot of adversities, you're going through a lot of stretch and strain uh, and, you, and it may be generational before you ever, but listen, do, do you understand that part? 400 years, that's four, four they, count, they, they counted it, 400 years, they counted it four generations in there. They counted 100 years of generation in Egypt. That must be how bad it was. I mean, you know, sometimes you're someplace and you think, how long have I been there? And you say, well, I've been there a year. Like, Jesus, it seems like I've been there all my, I just, you know, either you like it or you hate it. Well, he puts them down into a nation that's every bit, it's a, a very powerful nation, but the religion part to it is, is, is where the great conflict is. He puts us down in there and, and it gives, listen to me, it gives this nation, this powerful nation of Egypt, an opportunity for great change. He sets this, he, put, he sets this light and salt right down in the midst of them. And he sends one of the great all-time ambassadors of God to them, a man called Joseph. And you know what? There was great change going on until the, the ad, king and administration that Joseph was under died and Joseph died the bible says something really interesting a new came in a new came, king came in with a whole different old with the old school agenda and put all this stuff that had gone on ahead of him to death to, to, to right to bed and so god is preparing a people here this religion is not good god is everything god is everything then out of that group, he, he raises up when it's time to deliver that group of people out of that nation. See, he gave that nation a great shot, didn't he? And that nation took it to begin with. Listen, there was great evangelism and the word of God was being taught. A lot of wonderful things was happening in Egypt under Joseph. 
He was an ambassador of salt and earth. He's a wonderful ambassador. Listen, God is looking for those kind of people in America and the world. Uh, who just lived that life for God out there, and it changed. But everywhere Joseph went, it got changed. It went to Potiphar's house, and Potiphar's house got changed. It went to prison, and the prison got changed. It went to the palace, and the palace got changed. Then when God's ready to do this again, when God's ready to take them out of Egypt and put them into a, seven nations with the same character, he raises a guy called Moses. And he goes into heavy training of this guy to put him in there and pull him out, to take him out to, a, to a, a build a whole thing out into a nation that's just like Egypt. It's just like Egypt. Religious, religiously, they've had 400 years of this. And the problem was that generation that came out were eat up with it and never got to the promised land. Listen, when you talk about two or three million people or, or whatever came out of there, I mean, a lot came out, didn't they? I mean, people still are, 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 are we only know once they took the census how many people. And, and then we only know how many fighting men they had. When it says they had 600,000, that's fighting men. I mean, you know, then, you know, mathematically we go like, well, wow, we can maybe double or triple or more of that. So that's how we get to those numbers. But, I mean, he raises up this man, Moses. And Moses goes in and he's that it's the same way. He goes in there with the power of God. And this guy that the old school Egyptians they're not going to let them go. They're not going to do this. I mean, I don't believe you're God. And so it becomes a contest between gods. Wasn't it? The, the ten plagues are a contest between the two gods. Just like El Elijah on the Mount of Carmel. Right? And so they match them for a while, right? Moses does this. The divination does that. Moses does this. The divination does that. And there's a, God goes like, okay, we're done with that game. And then it's all by God. The rest of them surrender. They all put their sword in the, in the box, right? It's a wonderful story, isn't it? It's a wonderful story about how God can use people that sell out, just sell out to God. See, we're, let's say I was, a word came, I, I can't use that. Uh, we only do things halfway. We're only halfway people. But it's interesting to me. When you go to Isaiah, who is under the fifth, right? Isaiah. Isaiah, 19th chapter, verse 3 and 4. Uh, the first four verses, the first four verses of Isaiah uh, 19 is an ode to Egypt. And I gave you, and here's what he's going to say, I gave you a shot. And you didn't take it. You stayed with divination. And, here was, and here's what's going to happen to you. Now, he does the same thing with Babylon. Right? He does the same thing with Babylon. Look at the shot they got. I mean, he sent some of the greatest godly people to them you could ever hope for. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach. He sent a generation of young people with great prophets like Jeremiah uh, 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 and these men. He sent them. He sent them with them. And, and listen, one of the great stories of great stories is the great ministry Jeremiah had to prisoners. I mean, POWs. And the second generation setting under his godly teaching, boy, were they something were they something, the Daniels and, the, and, and that group of kids, they were wonderful. They were wonderful, which is a whole nother story. And, and listen, here's a, there's an ode in, in Isaiah 47, an ode is given to Babylon. And it's about divination, about how God is going to bring, listen, I gave you a chance to, to walk away from that, and you didn't take it. So I'm going to drop the hammer on you. God sends you light. You, you dis, discard the light and go for the other. Throw God out and take the world in. 
the, the worldly system of satanic thinking, and at some point, boom, he's done. I just find these interesting because they're, 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 written, they're written by Isaiah. Maybe a warning to America as a client nation would be don't get involved in divination nor anti-Semitism, right? They're two big deals. Do not get engaged in that. And listen, as an individual believer, don't get engaged in it. The church must never be engaged in it. And you as a believer must never be engaged in these two things. Now here's the fourth point. The witch of Endor was a survivor of Paul's purging of the priest nation of divination. In 1 Samuel 28, 3, now Samuel was dead and all Israel had lamented with him and buried him in Ramah, which was his hometown, his own city. And Saul had removed from the land those who were mediums and spirit, spiritist, not spiritualist. I, get, I wrote that every time. In chapter, uh, uh, in 1 Samuel 28, 9, we read, you know what Saul has done. This, this is the witch of Endor. She says to the, to the stranger that's come to ask her to call up somebody from the dead. She says, you know what Saul has done, how he cut off those who are mediums and spiritists from the land. And you're trying to trap me. Remember that? She says, you're trying to trap me. And I'm not going to go for that because my head will roll and yours won't. And I'm not going with that. And then he convinces her. And she goes along. Purging the priest nation was part of the great reform of King, Hos uh, King Josiah, uh, Josiah. If you know anything about the great King Josiah, you'll know that he led a great, and one of the great uh, part of it was purging the nation of divination. Part of that. You can read about it in 2 Kings 23, 24 through 25. However, right after him, in Second King, or before him, in Second Kings twenty-one one through nine, you've got King Manasseh. King Manasseh is probably known as the worst evil king ever. That's how he's known. And and of course he promoted it. He promoted it rather than get rid of it. In um, in Second Kings twenty-one two, it says, it says about Manasseh, he did evil in the sight of the Lord. I mean, he was open and bold with it. I mean, he didn't do it behind closed doors. He was open and bold with it. I mean, he, he pushed it in God's face. King Manasseh. If you know anything about the kings, you know about King Manasseh. Just like if you know anything about the kings, you know about Josiah, Hezekiah, Josiah, these, these men who led great reformations in, in their land. In, in 1 Chronicles, this is interesting. In 1 Chronicles 10, verses 13 and 14, it says, So Saul died. So Saul died for his transgress, which he committed against the Lord, because of the word of the Lord, which he did not keep. We've talked about that. And, watch this, and because he asked counsel of a medium, making inquires of it and did not inquire of the Lord. Therefore, he killed him and turned the kingdom over to David, the son of Jesse. That should be the son of Jesse. Now, here's a principle that comes out of 1 Samuel. It's a principle, a biblical principle, that comes out of 1 Samuel 28, 19. You may have heard of this. I don't know, but this is where it comes from. It's a saying that says, he who speaks to the dead will soon join them. You ever heard that? Well, I don't know. But that's a, and it comes from 1 Samuel uh, 28, 19. The concept. That's the phrase that became a biblical concept. He who speaks to the dead will soon join them. Here's my final point for today. Believers should avoid dabbling experimenting, dabbling with divination devices such as the Ouija boards, horoscopes, psychiatric, psych, psychotic hot, hotlines, psychic, psychic, psychic hotlines. Uh, you probably, psychotic hotlines probably be good for you. Uh, 
Palm and tea reading. Now, here's here's where I want you to I want you to I want you to write down in your piece of paper here for point five. This is where Psalms, in my opinion, this is where Psalms 106, 35 through 43 will become important to you. Well, it's up there. It's Psalms 106, 35 through 43. I mentioned it earlier. This is where this will be good for you to put. This is where it'll have maybe some meaning. Now, you listen, you don't need this stuff. Don't even play with it. Get a deck of cards and play Old Maid or something. Uh, don't dabble with this stuff. Don't dabble with it. Don't dabble with it. That, that's what I mean by avoid dabbling with it. Stay away from it. It's not necessary. You have God Almighty. You have the Word of God. You have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. What are you doing? It's, it's not a game to play. I mean, get a hockey stick. Go out and beat a can. <laughs> Run around the yard and whip that can. Right, get a can down the road. Get a dog. Right, get a dog. They'll run you to death. Let them out the backyard, and it'll take you two days to find them. Second Corinthians 2.11. Here's a verse that's worth our time. So that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan, we are not ignorant of his schemes. He has a scheme to take advantage of us. That's what he's after. How could he, listen, I'm trying to get a hook set on you. So he baits you, tries to hook you, so he can pull you in. Because his idea is to get you to do his will, not God's. Get you to do his will, not God's. That's not brain surgery, isn't it? Who could not understand that? Here's 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2. The Holy Spirit especially says that in the latter times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons by means of hypocrisy of lies, seared their conscience with a brand, as, as with a branding iron. Boy, that's pretty tough, ain't it? I've seen, I've seen cattle, oh, cattle, cattle brand, branded. And, uh, yeah, uh, something. Wouldn't want that. Galatians 3 1 is one of these passages that says, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Who has bewitched you? Who has hypnotized you? Before who eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed and crucified. One of the interesting things, because we've taken missionary trips to different parts of the world. One of the things that you'd, would serve you well if you go on mission trips outside of the United States, South America, um, Louisiana. New Orleans. Yeah. New Orleans. <laughs> Anywhere in Louisiana. Um, it, it would serve you well to read Paul's missionary trips to see what he encountered culturally. Because what you're going to find are nations eat up with divination. By that I mean some kind of false religious system. And God has sent you in there to be that Joseph guy. To be that Moses. Maybe to bring light. Maybe to bring people out of darkness. Whatever. He doesn't send you in there for any other reason. You're either a Joseph or a Moses. And if you read Paul's trips, and I wrote some, like here's one with, with, uh, with Stephen, Philip, and these guys in the early church. You have Acts 8 uh, in Samaria. A lot of divination in, in that. And then uh, the island of, pa uh, of Papos, uh, you have it there. 
And then uh, Philippi, you have what was called the Python demon who guarded the, the temple of uh, Delphos, Delphi. Uh, these were all things that were, I mean, you're going to run in. Listen to what you're going to run into. If you've got, I don't care what they're called. I, and I don't care how old their religion is. If it's not Christianity with Christ on the cross, dying for your sins, being raised from the dead the third day, you, you've, got, you've got a divinational program. You've got something in there that's goofy. So you need to be aware of that. Uh, in Philippi, uh, uh, Ephesus, Ephesus, there was, a, there was a demon that was called the demon of evil. Boy, the demon of evil. We got the python demon. You got all kinds of demons out there. Uh, some were called unclean demons. So what you ought to do if you're going to take these trips uh, to foreign countries, you, I know you do this. You take a look to see what kind of religions are in there. You kind of look at culture, what's, what's the economics and what, what, how people live and all that, what kind of culture. But listen, what you ought to do is read some of Paul's trips and some of the other trips that guys were taking just to get a feel because when you come up and they've got like not so much in the Philippines, I guess, uh, you've got, but you have got all kinds of religions, but especially where Rick went in, into Burma. I mean, you really got some stuff in there. I mean, this is like Paul going into Philippi and places like that. So, um, but God don't send you anywhere that he's not going to um, l- let the light shine. I mean, it's, it's either to let the light shine or to, or to, or to pull, pull people out. So let's have a word of prayer. Father, we're thankful today for these that have come our way to study with us. We pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the word of God. We, we've, we've looked at other cultures, Father. It doesn't matter what the religion, it doesn't matter what they call them. I mean, they're just going to call them something they can get away with. The truth of the matter is they're divination, they're, they're evil, they're demonic, and Satan runs them and controls them. And you can see how they just, how you have to know how to deal with the authority system on the divine side to deal with them on the authority system of the evil side. And uh, studying how Paul dealt with it would be really interesting for those who are on mission trips. So we thank you, Father, for this. For those who are with us in the Internet, many of them are living in nations that that are controlled and operated from top down with, with e- evil religions and things of that nature. And, and there they are Christians and, and they're strategically placed for good reasons. And we pray for them. We pray for these believers all over the world, Father, that uh, click in and listen to us and, and we try to arm them well with the full armor of God that they may do diligent warfare in a spiritual way in their nations, for we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.